Right, I, uh, I hope I can be heard all right. Is it okay at the back? Right, but just put your hands up if suddenly something, uh, something goes wrong. Uh, I must start off with an apology about the pullover. I was thinking of wearing a suit, but I thought, no, nobody will recognise me. Uh, but um, sadly, I don't have uh, a Celtic uh, jumper, and this, I'm afraid, is a Viking one. But, uh, and uh, the other thing I was thinking about was uh, the first time I ever gave a lecture here was uh, during the electrician strike, and at five o'clock, all of the lights went out and I lectured in this room by candlelight, which was a very memorable uh, occasion. Now, I had forgotten that there was going to be a, a fair amount of business beforehand So uh, uh, when I prepared this lecture, so it's a little bit on the long side, so I'll be trying to cut down in various areas, uh, but uh, some of the material is, uh, is published, so I'll uh, uh, try and uh, refer you uh, to that. Right, well, let's uh, get into uh, things uh, straight away, and uh, let's just get my arrows right. Of course, in this year here in Britain, there's been a lot of interest in uh, the Celts in one way or, or another, and obviously uh, there is the Celtic exhibition at the British Museum, which I hope a lot of people have seen. It uh, is really good, and uh, I must say at this stage, um, I and the people at the British Museum largely see eye to eye on, on the Celts, which is more than I can say for the television programmes that are on. Um, a real missed opportunity, I think, uh, to, uh, 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 to be looking at uh, something new and discussing uh, the ideas that I and various other archaeologists, uh, one or two of them here present, uh, um, like Tim Champion, have been putting forward over the last uh, 20, 30 uh, years. Uh, but um, we've also had a couple of uh, major conferences in Glasgow. Uh, one uh, was the International Celtic Studies uh, Congress, uh, which uh, I normally try to uh, attend, and they're actually accepting some of my ideas now. Uh, and also the European archaeologists, one of the main themes there was the, uh, the Celt. So there's uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of interest uh, uh, at this moment in the Celts. But um, there are some rather peculiar things started uh, appearing in the press, or uh, things that were um, uh, had appeared before and one had hoped were dead, like statements like the Celts never existed, and that people like myself uh, said this. I never did. It's the complete invention. It's one of those <laughs> things that's gone all the way around Europe, and uh, I've spent a lot of my life digging up people who thought of themselves as Celts. Uh, in the first century BC. So uh, that was where I started getting involved in uh, what was going on in the uh, British Museum. Uh, I hadn't been involved in actually setting up uh, the, uh, 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 the exhibition or the theme, but it's structured around what is unfortunately labelled as a Celto-skeptic uh, framework, and I think we'd better deal with that word uh, as well. Uh, it's a term which was introduced by Patrick Sims Williams, the uh, professor uh, of uh, Celtic studies in Aberystwyth. And, and uh, unlike uh, Eurosceptic, uh, which is anti Europe, Celtosceptics are pro Celts. Uh, we're trying to get rid of a lot of the, uh, the rubbish uh, uh, that is written uh, about Celts, you know, these uh, drunken barbarians and so on. And indeed, Patrick himself describes himself as a Celtosceptic. The critique that uh, we have been going through in these last 20, 30 years, uh, I think, is now largely accepted by most uh, British not all, but most uh, British uh, archaeologists, and uh, quite a wide number of continental uh, Iron Age uh, archaeologists. I still um, have a good old battle with uh, the, the linguists. We don't entirely uh, think in the same way, but uh, I'll, they'll come round one day. Um, but at any rate, uh, some of the basic things, I mean, the one that gets the most press is that uh, there is no evidence that the early inhabitants of Britain were ever called Celts. You get statements like the Britons were like Celts. You even get Strabo saying uh, about one of his fellow Greeks, oh, he got mixed up between the Celts and the Britons. So we have to accept that, uh, the, uh, that it is not a term that was used uh, for whatever reason, ethnic, uh, geographical, or whatever, was not used to the inhabitants of Britain. Uh, 
But there's also been a, a change in the theoretical basis of how we study the Celts. And for me, this is based in the new archaeology of the 1960s, 1970s, and the rejection of the so-called culture historical paradigm. And uh, uh, my generation was using very much more uh, anthropological and geographical models rather than ones based on uh, philology. But at any rate, it's led us on to sort of fundamental questions like why are Celtic languages called Celtic? Why are the Scots, Irish, Welsh, and Bretons called Celto Celtic? Coming to the archaeology, what is meant by Latin culture and why is it equated with Celtic? Today I'm talking about why is Celtic art called Celtic? And why do we think the Celts originate from southern Germany or from southwest I Iberia? And uh, so it's a lot of very fundamental questions which we're asking. And was, as with any, anything Celtic, uh, the, the answer is not simple. It's uh, always very uh, convoluted in one way uh, or another. As I said, no informed archaeologist has ever suggested that the Celts never existed but uh, we would consider them to be a, uh, a continental uh, phenomenon. I also insist that we need to distinguish between the ancient Celts and the modern Celts and the way that we go around studying. They are different phenomena, definitions and the, way, and the questions that we're asking uh, of the, uh, the material uh, are different and uh, we just have to uh, accept this. I suppose there have been three books, um, there have been a lot of articles that uh, many of us have written, but really just three books which have uh, dealt specifically with this problem. The first one which caused all the consternation, written by Simon James, uh, published in 1999. And uh, this is where all these statements uh, uh, like the Celts never existed come, for, come from. If one reads his text, he doesn't say it. Uh, he talks about the Celts on the continent. Um, he was an archaeologist. The other uh, person uh, uh, that I ha had a fair amount of dealings with uh, was uh, Mike Morse, coming in from the history of uh, science. Uh, he uh, uh, studied in, uh, in Chicago and looking at, uh, well, uh, things like the impact of uh, techniques like, uh, um, well, the li linguistic studies, but craniology and so on. That was, for me, uh, quite a res revelation when he came and talked to me about it. And then there's my own book, which uh, is ta takes, they were talking mainly about Britain. Uh, I was taking a rather more uh, continental view. And uh, so those, are, as I said, are really the, the, the three books. Some of this I'll uh, perhaps go through fairly quickly because just recently uh, I've had a paper uh, uh, come out uh, called The Sheffield Origins of Celtic Art. Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later on in, in, in uh, brief, but it's, uh, uh, it needs to be uh, updated and, uh, um, uh, and uh, sort of new things have been coming out. But I've also been going on to look at what's happening on the continent and also taking it on a little bit past uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the 19th century on which I, and early 20th century, which in that article I was concentrating on. Now, first of all, we need to look at the British background because basically the idea that this art is Celtic comes from Britain. It doesn't come from uh, the continent. And so we have to under, uh, understand why people uh, were considered uh, to be uh, Celts. I don't want to go the, into this in detail, but um, the, uh, first of all, the statement that uh, um, they were never called Celts, it's not something new. Uh, and uh, I don't know where the first article appeared, but a major article by Ian uh, uh, McNeil 100 years ago, talking about the rediscovery of the, uh, the Celts and the importance of people like George Buchanan uh, and his publication in 1582 uh, of uh, uh, looking at the British or and Irish origins, but especially uh, looking at it uh, uh, from perhaps a Scottish uh, point of view. And we must also be aware that Celtic languages got their name because uh, Breton, uh, Pauli Pezeron, uh, thought that the language, his language, Breton, was the final survival of the language spoken by the, the Celtae uh, of Caesar, 
In fact, it's not. It is a language, most linguists, I think, would say that it is a, 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 a language which was introduced from Cornwall and Wales uh, in the post-Roman period. So as a British language, it's not uh, a, a Gallic uh, language. The key person really is Edward Floyd, uh, and I won't go into, uh, into this, I um, must try and go, go fast, but uh, he uses the word, when he does his comparison of the, uh, the modern uh, languages and indeed comparing it with what was then known about the, uh, 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 about the Iron Age uh, um, languages, uh, he decided to use the term Celtic. Uh, um, he seems to have realized that it was perhaps not quite the right word to use, but in many ways he was following uh, uh, Pezron. And uh, so we have this uh, idea that uh, we can call these uh, languages Celtic. There's a process that goes on uh, in the 19th century, and, uh, um, and by the end, uh, in the 18th century, by the end of the century, uh, there is a substantial group of people who are thinking of themselves as Celts uh, in Britain and, uh, and Ireland. Um, again, a complicated question as to what went on there, and that, I fear, again, is another paper. But we must recognize that all other usages in Britain uh, derive from these original uh, mistakes, really, that uh, from Pezron and so on. So things like Celtic art, the Celtic church, Celtic music, Celtic fields, Celtic tiger economies, they're uh, all um, based on these ideas which were going on in the uh, 18th uh, and early 19th century. But that does mean that uh, there is a problem if we start trying to use things like language or art to define the Celts in the past. I would say because of the, the, the flawed nature of this, uh, we can't use those uh, as definitions. Going into the early 19th century, um, there are two things, uh, uh, there are really two groups who are looking at the origins of the people in, uh, uh, in uh, Western Europe. Um, mainly it's a sort of uh, a chronological thing in that what we're seeing is the change in the chronologies that uh, people were using. In the early uh, 19th century, we still were on uh, Bishop Usher's uh, so short uh, biblical chronology. And uh, so uh, it was considered the Celts, uh, or the people living in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Western Europe, uh, had, hadn't been there all that long. And indeed, one was looking at things like the Tower of Babel and so on uh, to uh, talk about where they may have come from. And so we find that uh, the, the Celts and Gauls, who were the first people we hear about in the written records, must have been the original uh, inhabitants, descendants of, uh, of Gomer. And uh, so we find in Amade Thierry, he doesn't go into the biblical background, uh, unlike Pezron, but uh, in, in the standard book, really, on the, uh, for the 19th century uh, is Histoire des Gaulois, uh, it's, um, he considered that uh, the Gauls were the original inhabitants of Gaul, and they arrived somewhere perhaps about uh, 1500 BC. But we then move on into the long geological chronology, starting really in the 19, sorry, in the 1830s uh, especially, and uh, sudden recognition that the, the, the world is very much older uh, than the Bible tells us. And against this background, we start getting rather new uh, ideas. First of all, Christian Thompson coming out with his chronology for prehistory with his three age system, the ages of uh, stone, uh, bronze, uh, and iron. But then we also get the idea that uh, perhaps the languages that we're looking at, the Celtic uh, and indeed the other in what are now gradually being recognized as Indo-European languages, uh, that uh, these people may well have replaced uh, earlier people. And uh, there were a recognition that there were people around who were not speaking Indo-European language. And who, so who might the earlier people have been? Possibly the Finns, possibly the, uh, the, the Basques. And the idea was that uh, there had been a change of uh, the population, perhaps at the, at the beginning of the Bronze Age. And this is where the craniology uh, comes in. Uh, and the three-age system, 
and it's suggested there's a change in the skull shape which indicates the arrival of uh, a new people, perhaps the Indo-Europeans, being defined by language. But at any rate, long heads in long barrows who are Neolithic, round heads in round barrows, as in the beaker burials, um, still not in quite entirely wrong, but uh, at any rate, this is where uh, these ideas uh, come from. So it's against this background that we must look at this term called Celtic art and ask anyone on, uh, or 10 years ago, if you'd asked uh, virtually anyone, uh, why is Celtic art called Celtic? And they would simply say, well, it was the, Cel the, the art of the ancient Celts, the, uh, the people who lived in, uh, in Europe. But in fact, what we shall be seeing is that the term was first applied to the art in Britain and Ireland uh, in the 1850s and was another 50 years or more before this idea was accepted on the, uh, the continent. And it was this man, De Joseph de Chalette, whose uh, um, centenary of whose death in the First World War uh, we were commemorating uh, last year. So what I'm going to be doing here is, first of all, we'll do, uh, try and do a quick uh, run through of uh, what was happening in Britain and then we'll go and look at why the people on the continent were not uh, accepting the British ideas. And then we'll come back to Britain uh, and see how they developed. And then we'll move on to see what happened uh, subsequently with Deschelet uh, and afterwards. One thing where I was wrong in my, uh, uh, the article that I uh, uh, referred to uh, was that uh, I thought uh, it was a man from Sheffield who was the first person who coined the term uh, Celtic art. But as Fraser Hunter pointed out to me, uh, this is not the case. There is an earlier usage, and it's by Daniel Wilson, who is probably best known as the man who introduced the word prehistoric into, in, in, into the English language. And uh, he was also an early, early user of the three-age uh, system. And uh, he refers to a thing called Celtic art, which for him is the art and ornaments of the Celtic peoples of Scotland. In other words, the people of the Highlands and uh, the Islands. So it was not something which was uh, confined to a spe specific period. And he doesn't go into any detailed definition uh, of what this uh, art is. He does also publish drawings of things that nowadays people would call uh, Celtic art but it's in a chapter on the Teutonic uh, Iron Age, although he does change this in the uh, second edition, which came out uh, 10 years later. But the sorts of things that he was thinking about, and, uh, well, one object you can see in the exhibition, the uh, Hunterston uh, brooch, uh, these were the thing, sorts of things that he was, uh, uh, he, he was uh, talking about. And, uh, but also, sort of going on very much later here, uh, a powder horn, and his only defi definition, really, other than it being the arts of these uh, uh, of the uh, Scottish Gaelic uh, pe uh, speaking uh, peoples, was that uh, one was getting uh, this interlaced ornament. Uh, as uh, and we'll see that that is a thing which goes on uh, and on. The man I was trying to champion uh, was uh, uh, John uh, Obadiah Westwood, and uh, I just quickly say that. Um, what I'm talking about here you'll find uh, in summary form in the catalogue which goes with the, with the British Museum. This, I think, is now, uh, these are things which we are, are generally accepting, uh, but uh, you never know, a new uh, person may suddenly emerge from somewhere. At any rate, um, this man, uh, John Obadiah Westwood, was the professor of zoology uh, at Oxford, um, but he also was very interested in uh, uh, in uh, art. In fact, I mean, he was uh, the thing that joins it. He was a brilliant uh, artist, and uh, uh, and uh, so he was drawing lots of insects, uh, and but also uh, looking at the uh, uh, early Christian uh, or Christian um, manuscripts, uh, both uh, from Ireland, Northern Britain, and indeed from the Saxon area. He is the first one to describe what he considers to be. Uh, uh, Celtic characteristics, very specifically a thing called the trumpet scroll or the, uh, the trumpet pattern, terms that are still used. And uh, this was uh, published in uh, the, the, the famous uh, uh, book, um, 
uh, on, uh, yeah, actually, we could just quickly go back. Uh, it's uh, Owen uh, Jones's book, The Grammar of, uh, of Ornament, which incidentally is still uh, in print, uh, though not in the fine form that it was uh, originally uh, produced in. But here we can see the contrast uh, with the uh, stuff that he is labeling as, uh, as Celtic in the, uh, the center, the, uh, the spirals and triscales and so on and then contrasting with the Anglo-Saxon use of foliage and so on. So he is introducing these uh, ethnic terms, really, to describe uh, different styles uh, of art. And he gives the first definition, um, narrow ribbons interlaced and knotted, or um, monstrous animals extended into long interlacing ribbons and so on. But if we, if we look at the last one, the use of red dots and points, uh, this is very obviously uh, just coming from uh, the manuscripts. So that is, whoops, that is the first uh, appearance. Well, I'll, as I'm pressed for time, I'll move over this, but he's giving a verbal description of what the, um, what the trumpet pattern uh, looks like. And then he goes on to say, that remarkable pattern, which since a few years we have been in the habit of calling the trumpet pattern, um, you have a peculiar characteristic, a form of beauty, which belongs to no nation but our own, and to no portion of our nation but the Celtic portion. So here we have a very strong statement about, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, about this style. We find a very uh, similar uh, sort of statement in uh, the next person we, we, we deal with, uh, which is John Kemble. Um, um, he uh, gave his famous lecture uh, just a year after uh, the, um, uh, the, the publication of Westwood's uh, uh, paper, but pointing out that there were also prehistoric objects. And this is where we must remind ourselves, this is the period when things like the Battersea Shield, uh, the Wandsworth Shield and so on, these were just uh, being uh, fished out of the, uh, the, the Thames. So there was a lot of new uh, material. And he again uh, emphasizes that uh, this uh, art style is a peculiarly uh, British uh, phenomenon. Of course, sadly, he died just uh, um, uh, a week or two after he gave his lecture, and it was then published uh, uh, as a memorial ball in the Ore Ferales uh, by uh, his colleagues, most notably Augustus Franks. And we'll see that this volume uh, is, in fact, extremely well known uh, across, uh, uh, across Europe, published in uh, 1863. And, uh, but they're going back to fundamentals again, uh, that these antiquities are chiefly within the limits of Celtic occupation. Uh, the patterns differ from those of the Danes, the Saxons, and Romans and that these uh, patterns continued in use with modification among the peculiar Celtic races of Ireland, though not in a pure state after the introduction of Christianity. So both for the prehistoric and for the uh, medieval usage, uh, it's being very firmly labeled as a peculiar uh, British uh, and Irish phenomenon. At the same time, of course, we have the finds uh, turning out uh, from the lake villages in Switzerland and 1857 when we start getting uh, the finds turning up from uh, La Ten. And uh, these were uh, being uh, collected by people like uh, Friedrich Schwab, uh, Edward Desor, who is, uh, introduces the three-age system, and uh, the, then the publications by Ferdinand uh, Keller. And, um, well, we started uh, knowing about these, uh, these brooches and uh, uh, other forms of ornament, and most very specifically the, uh, the very well-preserved uh, iron scabbards with this uh, uh, decoration on it. So we have the publication of these uh, finds uh, coming out in uh, the, 18, uh, uh, the 1860s, and... Um, one thing to point out is that uh, Keller actually was very familiar with Britain. He'd, uh, he'd worked here, and, uh, and they started organizing international conferences. So he knew people like uh, Franks and Sir John Evans face-to-face. -face. I mean, they would be able to uh, talk about this. And they recognized the similarity of the art with, uh, the, uh, from La Ten with uh, what was called the late Celtic art uh, in the Ore uh, Ferrales. But this is the thing that uh, surprises people when uh, I read it out. It is uh, 
actually taken from the English version of Keller's publication. We must, however, remind the reader that these ornamentations do not show the least resemblance to the Celtic implements which have come to light, and quite so little to those of Roman origin. We cannot, however, help mentioning the peculiar ornamentation so very different from the Celtic element. So here is the first publication for the site, which we all take as the absolutely typical place for Celtic art. And initially, it just wasn't accepted as being uh, Celtic. Uh, he was using words like Helvetic or, or Gallo-Helvetic. We'll clarify that a little bit more, I think, when we come to France. Uh, there's a recent article being published by Laurent uh, Olivier uh, to celebrate the, um, uh, 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 the uh, what is it, the 150th anniversary of the foundation of the National Museum. And uh, he was specifically looking at one of his pre predecessors uh, at uh, Saint-Germain-en-Laye, uh, Alexandre Bertrand. And uh, he is really one of the key things to understand what was happening in, uh, in France. Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, all of the people writing at this time, whether they're British or continental, consider that either the Celts or the Indo-Europeans were arriving at the beginning of the Bronze Age with these uh, beaker burials. But uh, for Bertrand, uh, La Celtique um, was the geometric art of the Bronze Age and uh, the Hallstatt uh, period. And he distinguished between the Celts and the Gauls. And the Gauls for him were people who arrived at the beginning of the Iron Age. And so uh, when he was talking about Latin art, which he never really did, uh, he would have been talking about uh, using the term probably l'art uh, gaulois. So he never really uh, discusses it, but uh, he had major impact. He published only really one object which we might label as, uh, as Celtic, and it's the, uh, the helmet from uh, Beru. Uh, but he, at the time, he had no parallels for it in, uh, in Western Europe. Since then, we have other examples of these pointed helmets. But he, the only parallels he knew were on sculpture and other items uh, from the Near East. And so he thought this was a, an import uh, from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the Near East. The only person in France who really seems to um, suggest that there is a distinctive art style going on uh, is a numismatist, uh, Eugène Houcher, who published a couple of papers uh, on uh, l'art gaulois, uh, on, based on uh, the uh, uh, the decoration uh, on the uh, uh, on the coins, but this wasn't really taken over into the studies of the other material, and this gives an interesting background to uh, uh, well the monograph which was uh, published uh, by uh, uh, Vincent and Ruth uh, McGall uh, 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 by the antiquaries. Uh, on the Basutes flagon, flagons, uh, and uh, they were just considered to be fakes uh, in France, which is how the British Museum managed to uh, acquire them. And of course, again, you'll see those in the uh, exhibition uh, in the British Museum. Move on to um, Germany and another group of objects which you'll see in the, Brit in the uh, British Museum exhibition are these famous objects from Waldolgesheim. The first person to publish them, uh, Ausenwert, uh, again, he is using terms like uh, Gallic uh, to uh, describe these. But Germany is, uh, is rather different from what is going on uh, in France, or at least as far as the main person who is publishing this material. Uh, and the public person who was publishing it was uh, Ludwig Lindenschmidt, uh, the elder, uh, the father, uh, who was the founder of the uh, Römisch Germanische Central Museum in uh, Mainz, still one of the major museums in Europe, especially for its conservation work. And he is the man who published many of the key finds, which we nowadays label uh, as uh, Celtic, uh, in a series of volumes, Die Alte Tümer und Sere Heidnischen Vorzeit. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly whiz through, uh, I won't say much about them, given the time constraint, uh, of the, uh, uh, the sorts of objects that he was illustrating, really, for uh, the first time. Not only the finds from museums, but also uh, from private collections. So he's publishing uh, some of the beaked flagons, some of them imports, but uh, some of them probably not. 
uh, hear the, um, uh, some of the talks a little bit later, um, uh, found in female burials, usually with a decoration uh, of enamel uh, in them. Uh, here are the finds from uh, Durkheim, uh, gold uh, torques, um, but uh, also uh, bronze vessels and so on, uh, with which one was familiar uh, in the classical world. Um, publishing for the first time some of these bro brooches. Um, on the right-hand one, top left, uh, a bit from the Schwarzenbach uh, uh, Bowl. Um, here are the finds from uh, Rodenbach. But here we can see what the problem is. You'll see at the top there, it's all labeled as Etruscan. And uh, he considered all of these things to be imports. Here are the finds from uh, Kleiner Spergler, associated with uh, um, uh, attic red figureware vessels. So this stuff was being dated uh, correctly to uh, the fifth uh, century uh, BC. And then here he's uh, publishing again the material from uh, Voldolgesheim uh, and showing some of the, uh, the, the ornamentation on them. Now, his he, most of the things, he just published these as little fascicules, which were subsequently bound together. Uh, and most of them are purely descriptive. But under Voldolgesheim, he goes in for a long discussion of what he thinks uh, these things uh, are. And uh, first of all, he rejects Thompson's three-age system. Um, and then secondly, he considers that all metal objects from north of the Alps were imports from Etruria and northern Italy until the Roman conquest. So no metal uh, was made, no metal objects were made north of the Alps um, until the Romans arrived. And he said the barbarians were just producing raw materials, uh, which were then traded to Italy for the finished goods. And so he's seeing the art objects uh, as being produced by the Italians for these barbarians, rather along the lines of what one finds uh, in the Black Sea, uh, where the Greek uh, colonies are producing things for uh, the Scythian market. And this is what he says about Britain, my translation of the German. Uh, we know of the Britons that they only use their metal for exchange, that Irish gold, like the British gold, silver and tin, was exported as raw material and came back to the land as finished objects. And uh, he goes on to say, well, um, in the Ore Ferales, they've got all these uh, things decorated with enamel. There was no enamel uh, until the Romans arrived in this area, so how can this be uh, pre-Roman? And then he goes on to say, if all the ornaments which through their arbitrary representation differ from the strict style of classical or equally early oriental motifs were declared to be Celtic, so an excessively large number of the examples of Italian metalwork uh, would, without ado, be assigned to a Celtic origin. So he's rejecting anything uh, being Celtic. And then he goes on, this is uh, one quote that, uh, when I lectured on this in Stuttgart, caused uh, amusement to uh, the German uh, audience. The attempt to represent some of these vessels and objects as copies from the Rhenish workshops could only be considered as a manifestation of that false national vanity, which through the fantasies of nationalism with which our neighbors choose to embellish their cultural links to their prehistoric past leads to uh, lively emulation. So he, uh, he is just rejecting any, uh, uh, just saying, oh, it's just the British trying to pretend they have a greater past than they did. So he is the man who is publishing virtually all of the material that we now label uh, as Celtic. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure quite how much his ideas were accepted uh, right the way across, uh, um, uh, across uh, Germany. Uh, certainly other people were writing other things. And so we have uh, Otto Tischler in 1885 coming out with the first chronology of the, uh, um, the La Ten period based on the typology of the brooches and on the shapes of the chapes on the, uh, on the scabbards. Uh, and he divided the La Ten period up into an early, middle, and late uh, on the basis of this typology. Terms which we still use. This, one, this chronology actually stuck, but um, certainly he is not uh, following um, uh, the Lindenschmidt line. There are a couple of other volumes which come out in the, after uh, the elder Lindenschmidt's uh, death, uh, produced by uh, his son. 
and uh, also one to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Romish Commander Central uh, Museum. Uh, and these are ones that uh, contain uh, Paul Reinecker's major papers on the chronology of the Lao Ten period, which uh, in one way or another we are, are still using. But it is interesting. I mean, first of all, he sees uh, some of the real classic objects like the Schwarzenbach bowl as being imported from areas of Greek influence rather than being uh, locally made. And though he talks about Celts and, to a certain extent, Germans, uh, when he's describing the objects, he only uses the cultural term Laten uh, to uh, describe them, as in uh, Laten uh, ornament or ornamentique or uh, Laten uh, uh, Denkmale. But uh, he is uh, uh, accepting that much of the stuff is of, of local origin. So that was why on the continent uh, the British ideas weren't uh, accepted. We now come back to Britain in the later 19th century, and the key person here seems to be Sir Arthur Evans, of course, director of the Ashmolean Museum, giving lots of uh, lectures, in fact, on Celtic art in uh, Oxford, and then very famously the Rhine Lectures uh, in 1895 in Edinburgh, uh, which was on the origins of Celtic art. And he is pointing out the cl classical origins uh, of the art style, and he's using the stuff of Lyndon Schmidt and saying, well, this, uh, these early objects uh, belong to the 5th century BC uh, from southern Germany. The problem is he never published his work. And so it's very difficult to know quite uh, what he was saying. We're having to rely on um, newspaper reports. Uh, there are lists of his lecture titles uh, in the archives uh, in, that I found in, uh, in Oxford. There's only one written out lecture which survives, and that was not very, very helpful. And then otherwise, we're just relying on what other people writing at the time were, were saying. It's about this time, a little bit later, of 1904, that we get the first book on Celtic art uh, by uh, J. Romilly Allen. And he is covering the whole, uh, as we've seen, uh, the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and Christian art. So he starts off again with the description of uh, the Beaker pottery, which it essentially is, for him, uh, the early Celtic art, and then the, the Iron Age and early Christian stuff, which is the late um, Celtic art. And he uh, is the person who really gets into the, uh, the, the knot work, and, uh, um, and uh, it's not a book which is still in print. The other major book which comes out the, the following year is the Guide uh, to the Iron Age uh, by the British Museum. And uh, this is written by uh, Reginald Smith. The problem with Reginald Smith is we don't know to what extent it's his work and to what extent uh, he is uh, using uh, Evans' uh, work. And it probably can't quite read it up here, but the very top line uh, on the left-hand side uh, is where he is acknowledging the work that is uh, being done by uh, Dr. Uh, Arthur Evans. Uh, and so he is one of the people who's referring to this. But here, for the very first time, either on the continent or in Britain, we see a direct comparison between the decoration that is appearing on these things that are labeled uh, Celtic art uh, with, uh, alongside um, classical stuff. So uh, the, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you have a classical uh, palmette, uh, and adjacent to it, uh, the decoration on the torque uh, from Lord Augustheim. So here we're seeing the direct correlation really going on uh, between uh, the so-called Celtic art uh, and the classical world. So here then we're beginning to see something which we can recognize a little bit more uh, in terms of our definitions. Back to France, because something important happens there. Um, and this is uh, initially the work of Henri Darbois de Joubainville, who was the professor, uh, first professor of Celtic studies in the Sorbonne. He says that he disagrees with Bertrand, who was making this di distinction between the Celts and the, uh, uh, and the Gauls. And he says, well, the two terms, uh, OK, the term uh, Galatai, uh, uh, Galli, uh, turns up a couple of hundred years later than Celtoi but it is just being used as uh, an uh, equivalent of one another. And on uh, the historical grounds, he's suggesting the Celts or the Gauls 
uh, are arriving in 500 BC. So here we see a fundamental difference. Rather than uh, the Celts being a Bronze Age phenomenon, they are now becoming uh, an Iron Age uh, phenomenon. He is using uh, the evidence of li linguistics and some, some of his ideas are rather bizarre. He talks about empires. Uh, the earliest one is the cavemen, uh, which is typified by uh, Polyphemus. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he, the only time he mentions archaeologists, he puts in brackets, um, archaeologists are digging things up in caves as well. Uh, so uh, this goes with his classical background. Then he says we've got non-Indo-European speakers, the Iberians, he suggests they could perhaps come from Atlantis. Uh, Ligurians, he thinks of the first Indo-Europeans introducing farming and arriving somewhere around 1500 BC. And then he has the Celts or Gauls arriving in France uh, somewhere around 500 BC, but coming from southwestern Germany. And this he was doing based on uh, the names of rivers and so on. Uh, this is my attempt uh, at uh, trying to work out uh, what uh, Darbois de Joubanville is saying, but essentially seeing uh, his Celts starting off in uh, somewhere uh, east of the Rhine in uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, and the River Main and, uh, and so on, then spreading to the Low Countries, then into Britain, and then only later into France uh, and Spain, and even later into uh, Italy. So uh, that is his uh, interpretation of what is going on. What is important from archaeology is that Joseph de Chalette then tries to fit in the archaeology with the ideas of, of Darbois de Joubainville and uh, published in, uh, well, the last two volumes uh, that he uh, got out on the, uh, uh, um, the uh, archaeology pre uh, celtique uh, and uh, yes, the second volume, uh, last of them, published uh, just before, uh, just after he died. But at any rate, he starts off with a, hist uh, a historical uh, synthesis of uh, uh, the, the Celts, and then, as I said, tries to correlate them with the archaeological record. And uh, what he comes out with at the end, in a slightly changed form, is the view that dominated really the whole of the 20th century. Um, and he is, the first time is we're beginning to use archaeology specifically to identify the origin and the spread of the Celts using uh, burial rites, art style, Latin culture, la civilisation de, de Latin. Um, his burial rites, again, one looks at it and says, well, no, but uh, he distinguishes between the Ligurians uh, with their burial rite of crouched inhumation, in other words, beaker burials, Celts with extended inhumation, in other words, the north of the France, and then the Germans and the Belgae with cremation. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, uh, as we now know, uh, especially the uh, main site that he and his uncle have been excavating at Montbeuvre, typical Celtic site, the capital of the Aidui, right in the middle of the Celtic area, uh, but uh, unfortunately it has a cremation cemetery, we now know, so uh, that uh, correlation just doesn't work. Um, in the location of the Celts, he follows uh, Darbois de Joubainville, he looks at this area uh, north of the Alps as being their origin, rather than Amade Thierry, who had been looking at it uh, at central France. Uh, he is also uh, considering that the Ligurians were replaced by the Celts in the Iron Age. This is my attempt at uh, um, showing the relationship between the areas of uh, extended inhumations uh, in the uh, late Hulstadt period and the area where it's being suggested by, um, by Evans uh, and, uh, uh, and also picked up by Deschalette uh, as the area of the origin of this uh, art style. But basically Deschalette, when he comes to talk about Celtic art, He's following the British tradition, and the people he's citing are Campbell, Franks, uh, uh, Romilly Allen, uh, and, uh, and Reginald Smith. So he is picking up very much on the uh, British stuff. He doesn't entirely agree with the, uh, uh, with the chronology. He thinks the Celts might have uh, arrived in France uh, a little bit uh, earlier. But at any rate, this uh, publication then starts having uh, an impact on especially the, uh, the archaeologists. And um, 
what we find going on in the post-war period is there is a shift from referring to uh, the late Celtic art uh, uh, of Campbell and Franks. By the time we come to Jakobsthal in 1944, it has become early Celtic art. And this change of nomenclature is associated with this change of idea of the Celts being a Bronze Age phenomenon uh, to them being an Iron Age phenomenon, whether one takes it as Hallstatt or, or La Ten. And so one question which I've still not really answered is when and how does this happen? Uh, I've looked at one or two authors, again, Ian McNeil, uh, in his 1990, 1919 book, uh, phases of Irish uh, history, is suggesting the Celts are arriving in Ireland uh, in the La Ten period. So he's picking up on this new chronology and uh, tying the archaeology in. Whereas Henri Hubert, uh, in his History of the Celtic People, arguing from linguistics, still considers that the Celts belong to the uh, Bronze Age uh, with their uh, Goidelic, uh, Q Celtic, and uh, uh, and then the Iron Age uh, is perhaps uh, the P Celtic, the, uh, uh, the Brythons. Uh, and so he's in some ways still following Bertrand. But at any rate, it means that in the period after the First World War, there doesn't seem to be a general uh, consensus. So it's interesting then exactly why Jakobsthal uh, goes on to have this really, this new chronology and this new, uh, uh, the, the, this new uh, nomenclature and it's partly under the influence, I think, of Deschelet, partly under the influence of the, uh, the British uh, tradition. Uh, but at any rate, his famous book, uh, his great book, is referred to as uh, early uh, Celtic uh, art. And so what we're seeing, on, and first of all, to quote Jakobsthal, in my opinion, the whole of the Celtic art of Celtic art is a unit. It is a creation of one race, the Celts. And uh, so we contrast between the nomenclature in Romilly Allen, early Celtic art is Bronze Age, late Celtic art is La Ten and early Christian. By the time we come to Jakobsthal and later, um, early Celtic art is uh, the La Ten Iron Age and late Celtic art is the early Christian or insular art. So uh, I think um, when we look at the idea that uh, the spread of the Celts uh, which domin uh, uh, was an Iron Age phenomenon, which is the idea that uh, really um, uh, dominates the second half of the 20th century. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jakobsthal was a key uh, uh, person in this. And then we have a whole series of maps which appear showing the expansion of the, uh, the, the Celts uh, from uh, southwest Germany, uh, suggestions of typological continuity of the artifacts such as brooches and uh, daggers and swords. And that is really the origin of all of the variations of this particular map. Uh, I just always take uh, the one from Mughal's um, uh, because it shows it all uh, really uh, very clearly. But there are lots of variations on this uh, particular theme. And we find similar things going on in, for instance, Jan Philippe's book on the Keltska uh, Plocha uh, the Celtic flat inhumations, where he is uh, looking at the arrival of the Celts in Central Europe. Again, in terms of uh, the burial rite to the flat inhumations, but also linking it with the appearance of La Ten brooches and so on. So um, quickly to sum up that, um, we find really there are problems with Darbois de Joubanville's uh, uh, interpretations. We just wouldn't accept his uh, basic uh, ideas. Also, I think increasingly rejecting the idea of uh, the culture historical uh, 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 paradigm uh, from uh, Gustav Corsina and, uh, and Gordon Child. And this is really the background to this uh, fundamental rethink that we archaeologists uh, have been uh, having. So Celtic art is only a British term, uh, as I said, uh, until the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and uh, rejected, literally rejected. They know about it, but they reject it uh, on, the, uh, on the continent. And then we get this change which starts with, uh, with Jakobsthal, sorry, with um, Deschelet, and then is taken up by Jakobsthal. Personally, I would like to see us giving up uh, terms like Hallstatt and La Ten as names for cultural groups. They have too much baggage uh, uh, with them and preconceived uh, ideas. 
And, but we have the words like style or tradition and network and so on that we can be uh, using. And for the Iron Age uh, in parachronology, we can use words, instead of Holstadt and Lauten, we can be using words like early and, uh, and late or first and second, already fairly standard in the, uh, uh, in, uh, the uh, literature. And I'm going on to suggest we really need to be rethinking how we construct our chronologies and the whole nomenclature uh, for it. Um, even one or two of the Germans seem to be taking up my ideas. So does Celtic art exist? Well, the answer is, as the British Museum will be saying, there are many Celtic arts, regional styles and local changes, but there are some shaped, uh, traits which are shared over an extremely wide area from uh, Romania across to, uh, 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 to Britain. Um, problems with the traditional use of ethnic terms in early Christian arts, problems with the origin of knot knotwork and interlaced uh, ornament. Uh, people tend to be using the term insular art, uh, suggesting that there are many different traditions that are making it up. And then um, a final thought, uh, how would British and world history have changed if Lloyd uh, had followed Buchanan and called the language group Gallic uh, rather than Celts, would the Celts uh, even have existed? But at any rate, that's my final thought, but um, we like drinking and celebrating, so I'll just finish off with this uh, picture where we were um, getting uh, the Peshrift, uh, mentally passing it over to uh, Vincent McGall. And uh, I'm very nicely placed between the two leading, uh, or two of the leading people uh, in the 20th century, uh, uh, between uh, Paul Jakobsthal uh, and Otto Hermann Fry. So we have lovely battles, but uh, we also have nice cakes and things together. So I'll stop there. Thank you.